press record and turn it over to Doug for introductions. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to United for Progress, honoring Holland's Latinx community. It's a real pleasure for me to, uh, to welcome back as our speaker, Ricky Levine. Many of you know her, she's spoken before to us, but uh, uh, she, since, uh, since 2017, has been the executive director of the Holland Historical Trust, which covers the Holland Museum, the Capon House, and uh, Settler's House. And she has well over 15 years of leadership in uh, nonprofit uh, arts sector. And since she's come to Holland, she's just done great things, particularly for the museum, stimulating growth and programming and outreach and uh, making uh, our museum more relevant, accessible and inclusive to the uh, whole Western Michigan community. Uh, Ricky has a bachelor's degree from George Washington University. So Ricky, thank you again for being with us today. We look forward to hearing you and uh, join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Doug. And I'm going to share my screen. And I have to get to the beginning of my presentation, which this is not. So forgive me, we were testing some things. Looks great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you for joining us. I love sharing with past um, things that are going on in the museum. And uh, I will, I promise, talk about our upcoming exhibit, which opens next week. But um, I have to take the opportunity to give you a little bit of an update on about what's been going on for the museum uh, over the last several months. So as, as Doug mentioned, um, and my screen is now progressing, excuse me. As Doug mentioned, we have four properties, uh, or actually he mentioned three. So the Holland Museum, which was the former post office, Capon House, which was Isaac Capon, who was the first mayor of Holland. He was also a partner in the tannery, which is, was located where the Civic Center is now, um, considered the, probably the wealthiest man in Holland at the time. We have his, his structure as part of the museum. And then just up the road from him is the Settler's House, which is probably the wrong name for it, but it's been called that for some time and we haven't changed it yet. It was built by an Irish ship carpenter um, and many, many families have lived there over the decades. In fact, into the mid seventies, it was uh, a residence. Since it's become part of the museum, we have restored it back to um, the early 1900s. So it, it corresponds with where we have represent the Capon House. And it's a really wonderful opportunity, if you have not been, to see really the haves and have nots of that time period. Here you have the most opulent uh, residents in the, in the Capon House and you have the working class family. So it's the um, have and have nots of the mid 1800s, early 1900s. And the last building in our venues is the armory. The first three are owned by the city of Holland. We pay them rent and, and showcase them as museums. But the armory is, is owned exclusively by the, the trust. And we use that space for uh, a number of events. Uh, our administrative offices are there. That's where I'm sitting right now. Our collection of artifacts that are not on display are in the basement. And then we also use it as a rental space for community organizations. So I could not give you updates without sharing the impact of COVID-19 on the museum. On Friday, March 13th, 2020 at 5 p.m., the museum closed its doors. And during the four months we were closed, we lost all of our earned revenue completely. We never opened the historic homes that I just reviewed. Um, obviously, Tulip Time was canceled for all of us, which is our busiest time of the year. All of our school groups, which also come um, in a large uh, percentage of them come in the, in the springtime, were canceled. All of our summer programs, our walking tours, our adult and family tours, everything canceled. Revenue generated from renting the armory, um, as I mentioned we do, was impacted for almost a year and a half. And as a rental facility, the building provides income 
uh, and for the museum, and as I said, visibility with community partners. Prior to the pandemic, we have hosted and rented out to local school groups, theater performances, a church, weddings, quinceanera receptions, reunions, uh, and it's also the region-wide exhibition space for Lakeshore Big Read and has been for a number of years. It's used for our internal business, including annual meetings, fundraisers, executive office space, artifact storage, and tours. And COVID-19 also forced us to cancel our three in-person fundraisers, which are held generally in the armory, and they generate $40,000 on an annual basis, so we lost those. And we also lost corporate, excuse me, corporate sponsorships for exhibits, programs, and events were difficult to receive because of company layoffs, decreased profits, and the collective fear of the unknown. So in a typical year, these are just a sampling, not in a, in a complete roster of the programs that we do. And as I look through this, um, the only one that we kept up in some format was the Meet Up and Eat Up, which is under the outreach. And that's our partnership with the Ottawa County Health Department. They feed children during the summer months that normally would get the school lunch program. We bring stimulus activities. So we're, we're stimulating the brain while they're feeding the, the body. Um, we were able to do that this last summer we've done it and, and the summer before, but at a very different way. Um, there was a whole lot less hands-on, but otherwise these were all canceled. So the Smithsonian Spark Lab exhibit uh, is a hands-on invention workspace for kids and their families to experience and learn the process of invention. It's been a game changer since we opened it three, almost three years ago for the museum and due to its hands-on nature of the space and the CDC guidelines, as well as state guidelines that remain closed from March, 2020 until just this past June. Uh, this closure impacted family visitors, family memberships were down. The museum saw a 21% decrease in family memberships between uh, the period that we closed and now. And, I, and I'm gonna share a little bit more about Spark Lab in, in just a few minutes too. So we reopened in July of last year after um, four months of being closed. And we've been essentially open for the entire fiscal year. Our fiscal year runs July 1 to uh, June 30th. So we were open for that year. And I wanna share a little bit of the stats that we've had. Um, the slide has a lot of data on it. So I just wanna highlight a few points. Uh, but during the last full fiscal year, months of the pandemic completely, we had 55 new members, which was great. However, our number of memberships reduced about 7% from the previous year. And I also already shared the decline of the family memberships. In a traditional year, the museum itself would average about six, actually over 6,000 visitors. And this year, we had less than 3,500. Other reductions in revenue, the museum gift shop, obviously people weren't coming in, experienced a decrease in sales from of about 26% from the normal year. We experienced um, an overall revenue loss of just under 26% due to the effects of the pandemic. And on top of that, we incurred additional expenses of cleaning products, plexiglass barriers, um, all of the PPP adaptations for our air system uh, circulation for everyone's protection. So in the period that we were open, we had about 3,500 visitors, as I said. We had 980 virtual programs. So that, that was a pivot for us, and that was a big game changer. And it was probably, if there was an upside to COVID, that might be one of the upsides we had because our accessibility with our programs reached a greater geographical range. It also reached people that might have some other accessibility issues to come into the museum. Um, we put our work, walking tours, five of them, we created virtual walking tours so people could do it themselves or even just do it from their, their laptop or um, tablet from the, the privacy of their own home. They could explore that walking tour because there were so many images and so much information to share. We did open three uh, exhibits during that period. And then we also had 22 cultural lens and exhibit related programs. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about cultural lens in a moment as well. So when we were allowed to reopen, we needed to have, as I mentioned, all the proper PP, 
in place. So the barriers, the hand sanitizers, a protocol for cleaning, procedures for keeping staff, volunteers, and visitors safe. And when we did open, we were open to a restricted capacity for the museum overall, but especially for some of the galleries, because some of our galleries are in relatively small spaces. And we were able to reopen Spark Lab just in June of this summer. Um, and as promised, I, I wanna share a little bit about Spark Lab and what it is and how it impacts our families. So as I mentioned, it's an invention workspace. It, it teaches the process of invention. And as children do this, they learn creativity, they learn uh, exploration, trial and error. And in the long run, it impacts who they are, who they grow up to be and how they think and explore the world. You may have seen this brief video before if you've been on the, the HASS program or some of our other programs where I shared it, but I promise you it's short and it's fun and it really shares what this exhibit is all about. The Spark Lab is a dynamic space for families to come together to get to explore this. It's a way for families to work and participate together. It's a way for school groups to work and participate together and collaborate and problem solve. It's a place for ideas, so that's, that's big. It, it gives them that creativity. Too often in museums, I think kids kind of dread going there because it's quiet mm -hmm. and it's don't touch, and the fact that they can do all of that um, at the same time in a museum was really interesting. This is a chance for us to, to be able to take art kids were two blocks down the street and say, hey, we just covered this and saw it in this classroom, in this lab. Let's go now to the Spark Lab and let you guys get hands on with this different opportunity. I think it's pretty good. I've liked how um, kids can try different things. Things that like I don't learn in school. This is going to be a spot that the classes can come and get some hands-on applications of things that they might be learning. It's innovation and it's invention and it's hands-on activities that kids and their families can just learn the invention process. It feels good because I know I made something else that no one else has yet. When you're looking at studying inventions, it's, well, how did people get from that idea to something that is sold or bought? It means that you make something new. Context is huge. Connections with what they're learning is huge. Spark Lab helps us really show what you can do as an inventor by showing what has been done right in our community beforehand. You know, when you know something else has been started somewhere else and we are fortunate to have it here, I mean, that's awesome for our community, you know, and, and to bring other people in and just that you guys care about the kids. There's people from different backgrounds in that room. There's kids with different experiences in that room. And my daughter already told me she liked it, so obviously she's going to bug me to come back. So <laughs> I think my son will make me come back. Um, anyone should come to Spark Club. I think especially parents with their kids to see how creative their kids can be. Spark Lab gives that unique aspect that not only allows parents and families to come together, allows it to be part of the partnerships of West Michigan Education, connects the learning to both the history and other things in the classroom. That's a spark in itself, and it's gonna be really great to see where this goes. So the activities uh, rotate on a quarterly basis, so there's always something new. Um, it's so funny, I haven't seen that video in its um, com complete form for a while, and I realize my hair is so different post-COVID than it was during the time we, we taped that. Um, anyway, the, the, the piece that, that I think I want to share here is that educators are thrilled about this exhibit because it fills a lot of their academic needs. So it fills the next generation science standards, 21st century learning standards, Common Core for English, um, and STEAM, STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art. I always throw in a silent H for history and math. And the Smithsonian, one of the reasons they chose us for uh, one of the exhibit spaces for this license was because we have such a rich history of innovation and invention in our own community. And so they knew we would be able to, and we have, tied in the history along with that, the new processes of learning how to be an inventor. 
By the way, we're only one of seven locations in the entire country that have a license for Spark Lab. We are the last one in Michigan to have one, but we're one of three. So, and we're the only state, and this is kudos to, to Michigan, we're the only state that have more than one Spark Lab uh, exhibit in our state. So as I mentioned, we had three exhibits over the past 17 months. Heinz and Hond actually opened the day we closed for four months. So we had our, our member opening on the night before, the Thursday night, and on that Friday by five o'clock, I had made the decision that we had to close. And then the, the governor would have closed us anyway, but it was just the writing was on the wall. So we were able to extend the exhibit, Heinz and Holland, um, for several months once we reopened. So it was supposed to close in the summer and we actually extended it through September so that people got an opportunity to see it. And it was a super popular exhibit. That one closed, we opened election reflection, which was right around the time of the election. It was a nonpartisan um, exhibit which shared things that people have collected over the years from whether they were national or local elections. Uh, and these were memorabilia from, from people here in Holland. And the last exhibit that just closed um, this past July was Matthias Alton Beyond the Oil Paintings. Matthias Alton is a very well known, prolific artist uh, who resided in Grand Rapids. He was an immigrant from Germany, but he resided in Grand Rapids for the majority of his life was well known as his oil paintings of landscapes and working people from all over the world, but he did a lot here in Michigan. And this was the 150th anniversary of his birth this last year. And so his artists, his art, uh, oil paintings were being shown all over Michigan. And we wanted to take a little bit of a different tact. Uh, we decided that we wanted to talk a little bit more about his process. So we were able to borrow some of his uh, etchings, his drawings, as well as his watercolors. And through that, we explained the artist process. And we had a number of different programs that really talked about how an artist works and how Alton worked, but, but also how other artists works too. We had, as we always do, exhibit related programs. All of these were virtual. And then we had our cultural lens programs. And as I said, I would share a little bit more about what the, that series is. This, pro, this series of programs fit into our strategic plan priority, which is to celebrate our community's diversity and one of our values, which is also to be inclusive. And as a cultural organization, it is our responsibility to be a safe place to share and learn from one another. We started the series several years ago and have been able to continue it despite the pandemic. And as I said, the virtual aspect of these programs really was a, um, a game changer in terms of the reach that we've been able to have. Uh, we have had almost a thousand attendees at our virtual programs. And by the way, most of these programs as well as the exhibit programs are recorded and are on our website. And that's another way we've expanded access. So if you couldn't be there the night of the program, you could still circle back and explore the program and listen to the conversations. We had our first virtual fundraiser, which was incredibly successful. Um, it exceeded our expectations. And because of the interest and success, we're continuing the series. It's called Preserving Our Stories. And basically the theme is to share the story of family owned business still in operation and still family run. We started with a sweet history, which was of course the Holland Peanut Store and the Fabiano family. And through this fundraiser, we raised over $25,000 for our education initiatives to the museum. And because it was such a success, we are doing another one. The next one is in October, and I'll share a little bit about that in a little bit too. One of our biggest focuses is accessibility and, and ways, trying to find ways to allow people to um, explore the museum and our collection. We've been open the free, uh, the second Monday of every month for a number of years now. Once we reopened, we we re-engaged that as well. In fact, I think the Monday we opened to the public was our second Monday of the month. So we were open that evening as well. So it allows people access on hours that they might not 
be able to come if it was just our regular um, daytime hours, but also it, it provides access to people that might not be able to afford to come to the museum because it's completely free. We offer, we're a Blue Star Museum, which welcomes active service members and their families to the museum at no cost between Memorial Day and Labor Day. We're part of Museums for All, which is reduced admission for um, bridge card holders. We also were open um, two years ago now, Veterans Day at the Armory, because we have a really special exhibit at the Armory. If you haven't been or haven't been for a while, you may have forgotten. There's a wonderful exhibit on Company D and Colonel Henry A. Geards. And so we hope to do that again this November for Veterans Day. A lot of it is COVID dependent because it's a pretty small exhibit space, but that is the plan. And coming in September, we're also offering reduced admission to educators, as well as to military personnel all year long. We've been open on Martin Luther King Day for now a number of years. We were able to do it last year. It was both a combined virtual and in-person event. It's a day that we open the doors for free, we invite school groups to come in if they, there are schools that are still in session. And certainly we invite families to come in if they do have that day off. Um, celebrating Dr. King's life, his legacy, talking about the civil rights movement uh, this past year obviously was even more sensitive than it has been in the past, um, or maybe it's been brought to the forefront um, a little bit more under a microscope again. And uh, we wanted to take advantage of being able to, to share and to teach. Our collections are, um, we have over 90,000 items in our collections. And we know this because we did an inventory in 2019. And in 2018, we started launching our digital collections webpage because obviously not everything is on display. And so we have over 10,000 items that are currently available through our website representing 93 categories in our collection. So we have a ways to go to hit the 90,000, but um, we really are, are jumping ahead and adding more things on an ongoing basis so that people have access again for wherever they are to explore our collection. As we look forward, we always look at our mission um, to kind of drive where we are going and how we wanna get there. It uh, drives our programs, activities, all of our focus, um, our mission, preserving our past, imagining our future, and our vision to be a cultural leader and a community collaborator, inspiring the next generation of leaders, thinkers, and innovators. And this mission is what is driving this next exhibit that you all came to hear about, and I promised I would share it with you. So this is called United for Progress, the Lao Story, and one of the things I'm very excited about it is our first completely bilingual exhibit, at least in my tenure with the museum. Um, and it is going to be something that we will continue to do as we move forward. Uh, because again, it's a piece of accessibility and it's a piece of inclusivity that we want to drive. So the story behind this exhibit, in 2018, I had not been on board for very long. And as part of my getting to know people and organizations in the community, I met Ed Amaya who at the time was the interim director of LAUP, which stands for Latin Americans United in Progress. And Ed has been with LAUP in a number of capacities, including a board member for a number of years. And I had heard of the organization, um, but did not know much about it. And as I told Ed, I knew that there was a black tie gala that they did as a fundraiser of the year. And I knew they did Fiesta, which is their Cinco de Mayo celebration. That's really all I knew. And when he and I started talking and I got a sense of who this organization was, their history and the impact that they've made on the Latinx community, I felt it was really important that it's a story that, be, that, that was shared. Um, because I think there's a lot of people outside the Latinx community that doesn't have a clue, like I didn't. Um, of what this organization has done and it continues to do. So that was the impetus of this exhibition. We briefly, in, in the exploration of the, of the exhibit, we briefly discussed the Mexican immigration to the Midwest and West Michigan. So many of the individuals that did immigrate started as migrant workers, harvesting crops like blueberries and cucumbers, 
Later, they moved into the factories. In fact, Heinz and Holland, and we learned a lot about this at our last exhibit, the exhibit Heinz and Holland, was one of the first companies that offered factory jobs to Mexican-Americans um, because there was a whole lot of segregation going on and a whole lot of discrimination. And by the mid 60s, the Latinx community was experiencing discrimination of many kinds, including housing, jobs, and education. And some key individuals um, whose names you may know, and you may know them personally, Tino and Lupita Reyes, Ray Gutierrez Sr., and others formed an organization they called the Latin American Society. And it was to address those significant issues and those um, pieces of discrimination in particular. And in 1975, they officially combined with two other organizations doing similar work, La Raza Unida and Bilingual Bicultural Committee, which was then a part of Hope College. And together they formed Latin Americans United for Progress. So the exhibit deeply explores the history of Laul, how it evolved from those three organizations to work on educational and political and community involvement, as well as cultural activities. Um, and, the, and the need to hire minorities for representation in government, as well as jobs in the private sector and fair housing. They also explored youth and senior programs, which continued to be a focus of the organization. Lau created a bilingual newsletter that addressed these issues. And as we were doing the research, we came upon a number of them in the archives, which proved to be a valuable resource to really explore the history. Um, and along with meeting minutes from early board meetings and interviews with individuals involved in the early years also was a big part of, of the research behind this exhibit. And the purpose of the, new, of the newsletter they write um, is to inform the Hispanic community of issues and events of importance, which relates to them. Through communication, people can be better informed about events and issues that affect their lives. So this newsletter addresses the importance of the vote. And I've highlighted the statement, which says in part, how the people that represent us feel and think will determine whether things that are important to us will be done. We're talking about jobs, taxes, foreign affairs, and then it goes on to say most important education. And later on the writer who, uh, by the way, was Tino Reyes, talks about how he had been in Austin, Texas just uh, a week before the newsletter was printed and he saw the results of not voting. He says large sections of the city where Hispanics live were run down because people were not making their wishes known through the ballot box. Only recently, he says, were people getting things done because of the awareness of the power of the vote. Obviously, some of these challenges still continue in a number of our marginalized communities. On the left is a letter to the director of the Mental Health Administration, um, and it outlines really some of the work that Laoc was trying to get accomplished. And it, it says there's a need to have Hispanics on the Mental Health Board, to design an outreach worker to work with Hispanic migrant workers, and to hire a qualified bilingual bicultural clinical child and family therapist. The newsletter on the right is talking about the Fiesta event and the role of the queen who was selected Fiesta that year. And that particular year, year had approximately 3,000 people in attendance. And it's still, pre-COVID has been a huge draw uh, for the organization and for the community. Photos in the exhibition include those from Fiesta, the queen competition, performances, and art exhibitions that Lao has sponsored over the year. Um, I have a side note, I don't have a, a slide of this, but um, most of you are probably familiar with the mural on the armory wall, um, which was done in the, uh, I believe it was in the 70s, and it had been damaged by snow plows hitting the wall over the years. And we just this past weekend, so not even a week ago, um, had it repaired. We had some volunteers who were artists who stepped up, matched the paint, which is faded paint, um, really closely, and it looks wonderful. And Laou, the history of Laou was they helped fund the original uh, mural getting done, the artist and, the, and the, the school groups that participated in that. 
So it was perfect timing to get that up and, and looking pretty before we open this exhibit. The queen competition and its evolution is important to understand. There used to be a king and a queen. The king part dissolved pretty early, but the queen stayed around for a number of years. And it was created as an incentive for young women in the Latinx community to be the best version of themselves. It was not exclusively a beauty contest. To enter, you had to have at least a 3.0 GPA. You had to be involved in community service and had a desire to serve and better the community. And the queens would serve as role models for younger children. They often gave presentations to their peers about the importance of making education a priority. Again, that ex education uh, emphasis. In this clipping in this paper, it was a 1997 queen talks about her desire to help younger members of the community and talk to them who don't have role model models to talk about sex and drugs. And the article discusses her role as a leader and a volunteer. Apparently she worked with the Community Foundation and her interest in boxing, which she said was a release and helped her keep in good shape. Youth pro programs have continued to evolve and continue to this day, as I've said, Adelante and Mas Adelante are the two primary youth programs that are currently um, part of Lao U. And early on, they were a one-time program giving students a crash course in life skills. And now ongoing programs to help students with both college preparedness and the importance of being community involved. The newsletter is talking about the student banquet that was given, which was an annual event co-sponsored by Lau and the Michigan Department of Education. And it was designed to recognize students and encourage them to complete high school and continue on to college. And it, as I quote this uh, newsletter, it says, education is the key to better oneself and to better future, and to a better future which will help all of us and our country. The banquet also saluted parents who recognized the need to educate their community, uh, excuse me, their children, many of whom have made sacrifices to help pave the way. So as with all of our exhibitions, we um, are doing programs in relationship to the exhibition. And the first one we have is the Saturday after we open. So a week from this Saturday on the 21st, it's a family program. It's the story of Dr. Ellen Ochoa, who was the first Latina to travel to space. And there'll be a, a story time, there'll be opportunities to explore the museum, Spark Lab will be open and Children and families will be encouraged to participate in space-themed experiments. And this is included with regular admission or if uh, a member family comes in, there is no additional fee for that. So that's the first program we're, we're setting up. The one following that is August 26th. Right now, it's slated to be a live event. It will be our first live in-person program. Um, we're debating whether or not that will continue and the presenters are uh, weighing in on, on their comfort level. But it's, just, it's a panel conversation to talk about Laob's history and its achievements, its present mission and its future with current and past Lao change makers. So the panel is made up of Yada Ramirez, who is the only full-time paid staff member, only paid staff member, full-time or otherwise. Um, She's their programs director, and she has been an incredible resource for us as we were putting together this exhibit. She grew up with Lau, and she knows so many of the people that have been impacted by it. Also on the panel will be the Reverend Benita Aguilera, who is the current interim director, Martin Veliz, who's a board member and serves as the treasurer currently, and Alfredo Gonzalez, who has been a community member and has impacted the community in a number of ways and, um, outside of Lowe, but he was one of Lowe's founding members. I'm very excited about this, this program because since I started with the museum, I said, we got to do a Day of the Dead or Dia de las Muertas event um, and celebrate this really, and, and explain this important holiday to Mexican Americans. And this will include storytelling, music, dance, ofrenda displays. The large picture here is an ofrenda display, which is the, the displays are put on um, the grave sites 
to um, welcome uh, and honor members of the family who have passed on. And then we'll also have participation by local students as well. We're, we're looking at an art exhibit with this. So very excited about that. And that will be at the Holland Armory. Additional programs are being added with focusing on one particular program on the Mexican immigration to the Midwest and the history of that. And we're working on some others as well. So that is our upcoming exhibit and related programs. Some other upcoming exhibits that I just wanted to share and, and get on your, your uh, calendars in October. So this will overlap with the, um, the Lao Oak exhibit. We'll have another exhibit area for the Night America Burned, which because this is the 150th anniversary of the Holland Fire, 2021 is in October was when the fire occurred, October 8th. Um, so we are going to have an exhibit sharing with that, and then there'll be some programs related to it as well. And then in December, we will be um, changing the Lao exhibit over, and I believe actually it's January, Contemporary Native American Portraits, which are photographs by a local photographer, James Cook, and the stories behind the Native Americans that he has photographed. And, their, their stories, their families, their tribes uh, will be explored in this exhibit. Some upcoming programs in our Cultural Lens um, series, Diversity and Cultural Celebration Book Club. This is a collaboration we've been doing really since pre-pandemic, and it's a collaboration with another nonprofit called Empowering Youth Global Connections. It's a book club. It started off as a children's book club, but now it is also including adult books. Um, you can sign up on our website to participate in that. In September, an insider look at diversity, excuse me, at corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's going to be presented by Joe Matthews, who's from Gentex. He was on the calendar for the April program, in-person program, the month uh, after we closed the doors. So excited to get him back on the calendar right now. That's also supposed to be a live event. So stay tuned to find out if that remains that way or not. Meant to be Loving Down Syndrome is a family program presented by and with a family with a Down Syndrome child. Meant to be is actually a book um, that the mom has written. And so it, that also will be a bilingual um, program for, for families. Uh, we are starting a new series in September called Tales from the Archives. And this is with individuals discussing their work that came out of research from the museum archives. As I said, we have a rich collection, which includes our archival material. First up in September will be a, a joint program with Jeffrey Reynolds, who will discuss how the local boat building companies contributed to the war, war effort during World War II by building military vessels. And Dave Brooks will be discussing the genealogy and family history of Sarah Tulk who's the one person to lose her life in the 1871 Holland Fire. Another program that's um, going to be announced soon will be one that's uh, about our caboose, the Pierre Marquette line and the caboose restoration that is currently going on by the museum. We also hope to have our in-person fundraisers again. So we planning on Museum on Tap in January the last event, which was also our first museum on tap, was in 2019. We had eight beverage vendors, 24 different tastes uh, available from those vendors, uh, beer, wine, and cider. We had a silent auction. We had 174 attendees. It was a lot of fun, and we hope to be able to do that again. Uh, trivia night 2022. We haven't had trivia night now since 2019, so it's been... Um, two years of absences. This has um, been our biggest fundraiser for a number of years. It's a great way to test your trivia, have a great time, spend some time with, with a whole lot of other people. We had almost 250 people in, a, in the last trivia night um, and our income um, is considerable from this event and you get food and drink and fun. What's up next in our agenda? Um, we are planning on putting together an interpretive plan, which will help us envision the future of the museum and how it connects with the museum. Uh, 
expand the digital collection and expand additional categories for public access, our calendar of exhibits, which correlates with programs, providing interesting and relevant and exciting rotating exhibits and programs for the community and visitors, and continue to deepen our partnerships um, with our community to make a greater impact. You may have heard about this work that we're doing right now. The Pierre Marquette Caboose, which is located at the Padness train station, is under a major renovation right now. The picture on your left is a before. Um, it was really in need of some TLC and we've started that process. The picture on the right is in process. So it's been completely painted. Um, the doors have been re repaired and restored. Windows are our next project. The signal has also been painted. And then what we're planning on doing is creating an exhibit for the community and visitors to the community to learn about the Pierre Marquette caboose, Pierre Marquette line, uh, train line, its history. What is a caboose? Who works in a caboose? What do they do? So it'll be a really family friendly exhibit. And that we hope to uh, unveil, do a ribbon cutting, some kind of opening before it gets too cold. And that's hopefully if all the work is done in time. Our current hours are from 10 to five, three days a week, Mondays, Fridays and Saturdays. Again, we are open the second Monday of every month from four to 6 p.m. in the evening. The clock, which is what this is, we don't know what it really was called. Um, it came from the World's Fair. It was from the Netherlands exhibit of the World's Fair. And because World War II was breaking out, they didn't want to ship it back. And so that became part of our collection along with a, a number of other pieces from the World's Fair. But that we run now, it was restored about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and we run that now the first Saturday of the month at 12 noon. So my role, as I see it, as a um, director of a arts and cultural organization is to just put out the plea, particularly this year, particularly as we are all coming back on some way from the pandemic, uh, to support arts and culture in your community, whatever you're passionate about, museums, symphonies, theaters, um, whatever. Um, we really got hit hard, as we all did, and um, we're just looking to, to stay afloat and to stay uh, um, available for our community. And I think a lot of people learned over this past um, 15, 17 months, I don't know what month it is anymore, um, that arts and culture and entertainment is really something that we all value. And so in order to keep us going, we need that support. So the way you can support the Holland Museum, a number of different ways. Be a volunteer. We have some wonderful volunteers that are HASP members as well. Um, and there's a number of ways to do that. We have a, a very new volunteer coordinator who has been opening doors um, and welcoming a lot of people from different backgrounds. And we'd like to diversify our volunteer base as well. Um, become a member. Uh, there's lots of ways to become members, attend programs like this one, but attend the museum programs, visit the museum or the houses, invite, tell a friend, shop in the gift shop. We've got some great things in our gift shop. Uh, and of course, always please consider becoming a donor. Membership levels are super affordable. Um, they start at $35. They go up to the premium level at $125. In all cases, you're able to bring a guest with you. So if you're a single person or your partner doesn't like museums, but you have a friend who does, you're always welcome to bring them with your membership. And that supports us as a way, as a way of um, allowing you to explore the museum at a different level. We have member openings. So for the Laoop exhibit next week, our member opening will be just invited members and guests. Um, it won't be open until the public until the following day, but you get a reception, you get to hear some people talk and make remarks. So it's always a, a fun event that way. Fun ways to support us right now, the Caboose, we have a GoFundMe to help uh, keep that fund alive and finish the repairs that we're trying to do. But also the ultimate goal is to then restore the inside of the Caboose, which will be able to open to the public periodically once that's done. And also keep that fun there because it is out in the elements and it will deteriorate again. And we do not want it to get to the point where it is now 
or it was before we started the restoration. So it's a way to um, keep that fund available for making those fixes as it a happen and not waiting for a real deterioration. And that can be done through the GoFundMe page. You can also just send a check or call the museum with a credit card number um, for that focus. And we'll be happy to put that in the fund. Our next Preserving Our Stories virtual fundraiser will be a family history of the Dykstra Funeral Home and the Klein Hexel family that is now running it for four generations. And that date is October 14th. Uh, we will be sending out information and sharing more information, but please save the date, put it on your calendar. Um, it'll be a really educational and also a fun evening, even though you know it is a funeral home, we're talking about family history. And I think it'll be a really uplifting kind of conversation. I can't do these presentations without giving a shout out to the corporations, foundations, municipalities that have supported us and continue to support us um, as the Holland Museum, and then certainly our community partners as well. And now I'm more than happy to open it up to any questions or comments that you might have, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. You just have a couple questions. Um, some go back to the beginning of your presentation, but uh, David's asking, do you have, did you have to figure out your cleaning and PPE and that sort of thing, the protocols on your own, or is there a museum association uh, which could invent this wheel for many institutions? That's a great question. Um, there are actually quite a few resources. Yes, there is a museum organization. It's the American Alliance of Museums. We are a member. That, that's the organization that gives us our accreditation. Um, so they were a great resource on what's happening uh, in the museum world and sharing information. But when you think about museums, you have such a variety. You have the children's kind of hands-on museums. You have you know, huge institutions like the Smithsonian, you have small regional museums like ours. So they were a resource and there was a lot of sharing of information, but I, I have to say probably the best resources were more local for, for our purposes. Um, the chamber, uh, West Coast Chamber did an extraordinary job of sharing information. And some of it was just about what can and can we not do? And then figuring out the PPE that had to go alongside that. The other organization that was a huge um, assistance to us is the Lakeshore Nonprofit uh, Alliance, of which I'm a board member, so full disclosure. Um, but I wasn't a board member at the time, and they were incredible with uh, helping all of our nonprofits, whether it be health and human services, arts and cultural, and everything in between, really share information and share knowledge. And um, on a weekly basis, we were having huge Zoom team meetings and sharing ideas and sharing resources. Um, I have to say also, my I have a, a board member who is an attorney who was a great resource for, for some of that information as well. So it was um, truly a collaboration of a lot of different places um, to get that, that all done. But we, we were allowed by the state to open up earlier than we actually did because we did not have all of those things in place. There was a back order on hand sanitizer, for instance. Uh, we had a custom design, the plexiglass at the front of our, our um, museum because we have a custom design desk. So it's not something you could buy off the shelf. Um, so there were a lot of people that helped with that, but that, yeah, we're there. <laughs> we're still going. Thank you. Um, David also wants to know, can adults without kids attend the Spark Labs? Oh, absolutely. In fact, before pandemic time, we did actually have some adult groups come in. And um, just this past summer, Hope uh, Science Camp came back again. And all of the counselors, who are young adults for the most part, came in and they had to drag them out. I mean, the, the, the principals of, of Hope had said, you know, you got, you got to leave. We got other things to do because they were having so much fun. I see it as a space that we had a Christmas party early on, you know, for adults, for a, a company. Um, I see it as a wonderful space for adults. And we love when the adults, the parents, grandparents, or um, other custodians come, come in with the kids and work with them and, and not sit in the corner, but actually participate. Yes, David, come, please. 
<laughs> I love it. Um, what time is the 826 panel discussion scheduled? It's scheduled for 7 p.m. And all the information is on our website. You can register there. We have registration open. And if we decide to um, pivot from an in-person event to a virtual event, we will make sure that everybody who signed up knows that and we will share that also on social media. We will probably be making that decision next week at the time of our opening of the exhibit. So we have enough time for the panelists and everybody to kind of pivot with us. Okay, it's gonna get a little noisy on my end. Um, we actually have people in the classroom, which is so exciting. We had a, a hope group meet. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself. And Doug, if you wanna just lead people in maybe a little bit more discussion, um, we'd love to continue answering any questions that, that might be there. Thank you, Susan. Other questions, just feel free to unmute and uh... Do you teach public speaking? I'm sorry? Do you teach public speaking? <laughs> oh, thank you, David. That's nice. <laughs> Ricky, I didn't realize the armory was such an important part of your program. When and how did you acquire that? Oh, that's a great question. And actually, it's going to open up another fundraising opportunity. So thank you, Doug. I didn't even set you up for that. Um, so the armory was acquired several decades ago when the museum was approached by some donors to convert the um, museum top floor into the Dutch galleries, which is what it is now. It's full of Dutch art and artifacts. Um, at that time, the administrative offices were up there. So with that conversion going on, and, and I, I don't know exactly the timing of it, but there were some people in the community that wanted to make sure that the armory was um, kept alive and kept vital. And so they purchased the armory from the city of Holland and um, donated it to the museum. And then at the time there was a capital campaign to raise funds to restore it uh, to, to what it is now. So the history is, it, of the armory is incredible, you know, from when it was an armory, but then it turned into a place where Hope College practiced basketball, some of the high schools, um, actually practiced basketball before they had their own facilities. So there's a, there's a great history. And, and if you go to our collection, there's some fabulous photographs of what the armory looked like back um, in its earlier iterations. Um, the fundraiser piece of that that I wanted to share is that um, it is a, almost a hundred year old building. And we've had some issues with the brick. Um, there's a water infiltration that's coming in through the bricks and causing some damage. And it has been going on actually since I've been here, but we did not figure out or didn't have the, the right people telling us what the cause was. So we put some patches on that we thought were fixes and weren't. And we have discovered what that real job is. And that's gonna be a multi-year process in order to do it just because the cost is so high, but we are going to be starting with that work this fall. Um, we have applied for some grant money that we hope to get, which will cover a portion of it, but more funds will be raised um, to really make sure that that's done. And then if any of you have walked or driven by the armory in the last several months, you'll notice that there is some yellow tape on the stairs because our stairs are failing, um, primarily for the same reason, because of water infiltration over the years. So we are going to be embarking on the process of restoring the stairs. So if anybody wants to help us with that, um, we will be making it a little bit more public, but that's another area of need. And because the city owned buildings care for a lot of the infrastructure, the city owned cares for a lot of the infrastructure. This is a museum owned building, so we don't have big brother to help us. We gotta do it ourselves. Other questions? Doug? Yes. It's, it's Jane Dalvin. I just want to put a plug in for anyone who might be interested in being becoming a docent. We have wonderful educational uh, opportunities for anyone who wants to be a docent. And you can uh, be a docent either at the museum or the Capon House, the Settler's House, and also to give the walking tours around town which uh, we, we do uh, probably from the time of tulip time through the summer. So it's a great learning opportunity and it's lots of fun. 
and um, it's a, about a three hour shift, although um, the the uh, the the houses, the Kapan house and the settlers house, those are open for school groups and those um, usually it's an hour and a half um, uh, uh, the timeline. So um, just wanted to uh, let everyone know that if you're a history buff as I am, um, it's lots and lots of fun. Thanks, Jane. Hey Jane. J Jane has been um, a docent and a volunteer way before I came. She's she's been um, a great uh, part of our family. And, and the, the volunteer opportunities. And, and many people think about okay, how do I how do I help a museum? So docents are probably one of the things that most people think about. But there's a whole lot of things that happen behind the scenes. Um, we're looking actually for somebody who um, is computer literate that would like to help us with our membership and our development work. Uh, we have a fabulous volunteer who's in her 80s, who's been working with us for a number of years. In fact, she was a docent before her knees went bad, and then she took on this role. But she wants to kind of step back a little bit. Um, and so we need somebody who is willing to, you know, help us out in that area. There are people that work in the collections area that do scanning of the archival materials so we can get them up on the computer for the public. So there's lots of different layers and, and our website can give you a little bit of a taste, but if you have any kind of inkling and you want to get involved, let us know because our volunteer coordinator will walk you through it and try to get a sense of what's of interest to you. You know, maybe it is what, what Jane suggested, but maybe you don't want to be in front of people. Maybe you'd rather be more of a recluse. We have those opportunities. Great. Other questions? You mentioned that the museum, uh, the city does not own the museum, and I, I understand it. No, no, the city owns the museum. It doesn't own the armory. It doesn't own the armory. Ah, how, how much support do you get from Holland City and any of the surrounding townships? So that's a good history. Um, at one point, the museum, <laughs> the museum was getting about a uh, over a quarter of a million dollars from the city of Holland. That goes back quite a few years. And I think it was um, around the time of the uh, recession, the great recession that, that money started um, falling back. And at, shortly thereafter, the museum went after a millage that if any of you were around uh, during that time might've known failed. And it was a millage that was um, a combined and I don't know exactly why, and nobody has, has been able to share this with me, but it was a combined uh, millage that Park Township, Holland Township, and the city of Holland had to all agree that funding came to the museum. The city of Holland voted it in, Park Township voted it in, Holland Township did not, and then it, that caused it to fail. So we didn't get any of those resources. Park Township over the years has been a supporter, um, but because of their township uh, moniker, there's certain things that they are not able to do that they probably shouldn't have done when they did it. So we're not getting funding from them directly now. The city does still support us. In addition to helping care for the infrastructure of the buildings, they give us, and it, it can change any every year, but it's been averaging at about $100,000 for the last several years. Um, which is certainly not enough to keep us going. And that's why we are much more proactive in our, um, our really our appeals to the public, to the community. We are a nonprofit, we're a 501c3. Um, so your support is, can be tax deductible, talk to your tax attorney and your CPA for details. Thank you. Time for other questions or comments or uh... Any plugs for other organizations, uh, Jane? Uh. <laughs> David? No, that's to say goodbye. <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you very much. This is great. We well, certainly appreciate it, Ricky. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you from, from Hass. I have learned so much and uh, what a gem we have that we just got to get more people aware of it and 
It's just what's what you're doing for us and the children's programs is great. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you all for being here too. Yeah. Thank you, Ricky. It was